before we get into the show, I wanted to put out a hiring call. I'm looking for my next software engineering apprentice, a young .NET programmer to help me directly with my work, building architectural prototypes, figuring out new patterns, tons of coding. And I'm looking for a .NET programmer whose hobby is also programming. For the right person, programming isn't work, it's also play. And besides a job, I guarantee if you get into this role that you will learn faster than you ever have before. I'll invest in your professional education and we'll work together. You'll report directly to me. And if this sounds interesting to you, then just send me an email or give me a call. Now let's, uh, let's have a podcast. Optimizing cloud budgets in Azure with Greg Leonardo. The Azure DevOps Podcast is a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Each show brings you hard-hitting interviews with industry experts, innovating better methods, and sharing success stories. Listen on to learn how to increase quality, ship quickly, and operate well. And now your host, Jeffrey Palermo. Welcome to the show. I'm Jeffrey Palermo, your host for helping you and your teams move fast and deliver quality and to run your software with confidence in Azure, all while using everything the .NET ecosystem has to offer. The podcast is sponsored by ClearMeasure. ClearMeasure is a software engineering firm serving companies struggling with business critical software projects. And when failure is not an option, ClearMeasure guarantees your success. You can find them at clearmeasure.com. And also, we are in the second year of my architect forums. Signups for the next session are up. And if you lead a software team, if you're a lead engineer, a lead architect, software manager. If you lead a software team and are looking to collaborate with other peers like you running software teams, then you can sign up at the link in the show notes. And it's a great collaborative time every month. And for anyone looking for programming with Palermo, my video podcast, you can just search for it in any of the directories and you'll be able to find it. And my returning guest today on the show is Greg Leonardo. He is a cloud architect that assists organizations with cloud adoption and innovation and is currently a cloud architect and the owner of Webinology. He has been working in the IT industry since his time in the military and is a developer, teacher, speaker, and early adopter. Greg has worked in many facets of IT throughout his career and is currently the president of Tampa Dev, a community meetup that runs Tampa Code Camp and also various technology events throughout Tampa, Florida. And he holds a certification as a Microsoft Certified Azure Solutions Architect Expert. And he's also a Microsoft Certified Trainer and is a many, many, many time Azure Microsoft Most Valuable Professional MVP. Greg, welcome back to the show. How are you, sir? Doing fine, sir. How about yourself? I'm great. I'm great. Uh, we haven't had you on since episode 250, which we'll, we'll link to in the show notes. But but glad to have you back. I encourage the listeners to go back and, and listen to that episode. But for those who, who haven't heard that and, and maybe they haven't been to a Tampa Code Camp or, or heard you speak at, at a conference, I'm just kind of pause and a quick introduction. What do you think made you an awesome software guy? That's a different question. <laughs> I think the big question to me is probably like you. I think our time in the military made us that way because we looked at things beyond ourselves. So I think the whole point behind what made us so successful in this industry is because we care about the well-being and, and the education of others. And we want to elevate those around us because we feel that elevates what we do. So our challenge is to challenge others to do better, which then in turn challenges us to do better. So I think it's mm. a never ending cyclic thing. Yeah. Yeah. When you're talking, it made me think about the original agile manifesto uh, about interacting with your customers more than just looking at the terms of the contract or the terms of the spec. It's all about right. someone's got to use the software to get something done. And as much as we love it to be the opposite, they don't care about using their software. They don't want to use software. They just have to use the software sometimes to get their job done. Absolutely. Well, speaking of helping other people, you did a, I think it was a talk in one of the, the code camps and definitely a blog post on optimizing Azure budgets. And there's not a lot of, really good detailed information out there. I mean, there's, there's the documentation and this is how much it costs and stuff we're going to use. But when we're planning out the architecture of an application or even one that's already running, 
there's not a lot of resources to answer the question, hey, how much is this going to cost to run? Think about it like this, right? So the way I looked at this is um, when, when you buy a car, right, there's ways to optimize your car to make it run better on gas mileage. There's mm. maintenance that you need to do in order to keep it up. And if you don't, it'll end up burning oil and gas, right? And, yeah. and become worse off, right? It's the same way when you look at things from a technology perspective. As they advance and as they grow, there's no real pattern for how to do that because they really want folks to kind of figure out what that means to them. Like when you buy a car, you and I look at cars differently. We tune them. We do things. We, we make sure we get the most out of them. It's that same point, right? And then others, like you said at the beginning of the podcast, are just going to use it to use it, right? So, you know, where I've seen a lot of the problems is, is that, that people read these magazines and magazine articles and say, hey, you know, move to the cloud, you'll save 30%. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's kind of an ambiguous thing, right? When you just stamp that out there and say, hey, you're going to move, you're going to save this much money. That's not always true. You know, I, when I had joined a few of my clients before, they're like, well, we're going to do this. We're going to do migration and we're going to save 30%. And I'm like, how can you say that? And they go, well, that's what we were told. And I'm like, I guarantee yeah. you, you'll spend 50% more. And they went in and they found that out. And then they come back to me and they go, okay, how did you know that? I'm like, well, it's not really a fallacy. When you move stuff, you don't really understand the things that you're moving, right? So you look at things basically on these servers and on-premises things and all of these tangible things that you can hold in your hand. And then you're told that if you move these tangible things out here, it's going to save money. Well, where do you think those things come from? They don't materialize out of nowhere, mm -hmm. right? So you have to move infrastructure and things that people don't really understand and know because it's not just the servers anymore. It's the, it's the routers. It's the firewalls. It's now all of these little things that they didn't know about mm -hmm. or take into account that in turn they had to move that ended up driving up the cost. Where a lot of people don't understand where the cloud shines is the cloud shines when you start doing things like what they refer to as re-platforming or re-hosting, right? When you take that application, you make it more cloud native and you allow it to use the services within the cloud rather than moving these big things out, right? A lot of the mistakes that folks have made that I've seen in the cloud is they do, they either move things from a very big perspective, which means they have these very large things on premise, that they had to have because it took a while to, to get servers, right? You had to, mm -hmm. whenever you needed to increase your internal environment, you needed lead time of a, a two weeks, a month, something like that. So you tend to over order these bigger machines in order to keep them on-prem because you knew that there was a, a lead process to get more if you ever needed it. Yeah. So, or you had the folks that said, okay, so now we're gonna take this and turn it on its side and we're gonna do micro segmentation in the cloud, right? which is another exasperating cost. When you take something off a shared service and you make it into its own services, you now increase exponentially the cost of what that was. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's a, businesses struggle with that. And, and what they do is they look at it like you began the podcast. They're like, well, I just use it. And they don't really understand that there's a way to really buy down costs, but you've got to kind of roll up your sleeves and take a better look at it. And I mean, they make TCO calculators and they make, you know, these frameworks and they make all the stuff to make it seem like there's an easy way to do this, but it's not really. You have to really kind of look down and go, you know what, do I need a VM? Can I move, can I just take that that app, uh, that web app or, or whatever and move it out as an app service? Do I really need all of this stuff? And, you know, what they tend to not understand also with going to the cloud is when your vision changes, right? When you start looking at things like, what are the soft costs that go around that, right? When you own a VM, you have to take care of that VM. You have to service pack it. You yeah. have to do all sorts of things with it. When you move it out to an app service, you no longer have to take care of that VM or anything. So you, now you've relieved a whole segment of, of support that is now needed for those particular things. So to me, a lot of the cost optimization really focuses around architectural optimization, right? You've got to get rid of the bad habits of the past and the technical debt that you've created throughout the years. And you've got to kind of turn it in to something different when you move it out to the cloud. Otherwise, your costs just transfer. And that's what a lot of people don't understand is the cost transfers. Yes, you're in a better spot. Yes, you get better SLAs. Yes, you get all of these things. However, the cost doesn't change that much when you look at these things. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. and I know I said a lot there. <laughs> well, there's a lot there. I'm thinking about these companies that have a long history of running all their own racks and cabinets, even if it's in a colo data center. 
it's their cabinet. Yep. And, and when you have, I mean, whether you have one cabinet or hundreds, you're going to have to have people on staff whose job it is to spike and destroy and replace hard drives. I mean, that's just a constant thing at some pace, right? If you're, if you're owning right. and running your own hard drives in a storage area network or anywhere, those things wear out and got to replace yep. them. So you have to have people on staff and those salaries are part of the overall budget. And those salaries don't go away unless you have nothing else. And I mean, maybe, right. maybe you have, you know, a hand, maybe you can decrease the number, but unless you're totally hosted in some way, whether it's cloud native or whether it's, you know, managed hosting, you're still having those salaries on staff. And, and so that's holistically, you don't get that savings until you've what finished completely migrating. So if you're expecting that to be a part of the equation, that's not going to happen first. Yep. Yep. Well, you run into twofold with that, right? Because the idea behind it is, is that the, the salaries don't live on the same side of the budget agreement yeah. as the, as the solutions do. Right. So people don't realize what goes into that. Right. So there, there is an avenue to looking at what repurposing is and refocusing your points. And, and in some cases, even having to drive down your workforce because the workload just isn't there anymore. Right. So you've got to kind of look at where these buckets go in because I caution folks moving, you know, I was, I was at a client where they felt moving to the cloud, they were going to get rid of their support staff for the shared services side, right? Mm -hmm. Because they don't shared services. They made it all owned by app teams. Well, the problem behind that is, is now you have to have these app teams with deep knowledge. And you and I both know that the developers and operations guys are two totally separate things. Each one of them's even you know, what they're graded on is two totally separate things, right? Yeah. They are, code guys are, are done by, by time scales and velocities and getting things done at a date. And changing and operations things. guy is uptime and, you know, looking at things like that and service packs. So yeah. they're graded differently. And when you throw all of these at a developer and say, this is now your job, you're now really either understaffing or underdoing exactly what you want to do. Because now when you run into problems, you're left to third party things because your developers are never going to be able to solve that problem, you know, yeah. because that's not their forte. Um, and it's not to say anything bad, good, bad, or indifferent, but there's very few developers that understand both sides of the coin, you know, when it comes to that or even how to troubleshoot it. So, you know, it is what it is at the end of the day. Yeah. And another thing that strikes me is if, if somebody has read an article that says, Oh, go to the cloud and you won't have to have, Sys admins, you won't because they're not going to be, you know, replacing the hard drives and and doing all these patches and whatnot. And then I look back on what we're we're well over a decade into actual, you know, real cloud migrations and whatnot. And it seems like we have just as many and more Sys admins as ever. Now some of them have been retitled to DevOps engineer. And yeah, maybe yep. they don't personally turn a screwdriver on a cabinet so much anymore. The nature of the work has changed, but I don't see that kind of category of role as decreasing. I think it's as strong as ever. It's just, hey, they may sling more shell script these days. Right. And, and I think that's the biggest falsation. So you you and I grew up in the development arena, right? So we we remember the old script kitties, right? And then .NET came out. And you know, a lot of the people that wrote scripts just kind of fell off on the wayside because they didn't want to take on this new object oriented side or in and didn't want to join the .NET, you know, arena. So you have to look at evolution and it's always going to be evolution. I was just having an interesting talk with a client the other day that they said, well, I don't see migrations as being a long-term process because there's only so many businesses out there, right? Mm. And I said, well, you're looking at it wrong, right? Because yes, we're migrating to the cloud today, but we have migration to cloud native things tomorrow. And then the next state is, is we may have migrations to the universe or whatever the next thing is. Yeah. We've got to remember that technology doesn't stop with the cloud. You know, if technology stopped with on-premise, then we wouldn't have had data centers, right? Yeah. And then all the stuff would have moved to data centers. Now we have the cloud. So everything's moving from data centers to the cloud, which are nothing more than larger virtualized data centers. What's next after that? What, what happens when quantum computing comes back in? Do we go back to maybe a more on-premises model because of its thing? Is it now a shared or utility resource? I mean, because what we've learned is, I remember it was 1964 when they talked about the CAN networks. You remember that? that? Yes. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You read about uh, it. <laughs> I actually wrote my thesis on CAN networks. But when they yeah. talked about how the future of compute was, 
they talked about compute as being a utility, right? Mm -hmm. And look at where we are today. Yeah. The cloud is just that. Yeah. You plug your app into the cloud, it just works, right? So, you know, we're heading down that path of the general points of evolution. And, you know, if we if we try to struggle with what titles are, because I'll, I'll beg to differ with you, I, I hate the term DevOps engineer, because to me, DevOps has always been a cultural change and a more of a yeah. business function than a than a physical function, because it requires a thought process change mm -hmm. that I think now is being stunted a little bit because we're starting to call people all of these things, right? And yeah. um, it's not really the culture change that that it was supposed to bring, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm just observing that that's what's tending to happen a lot. Yep. So, well, <laughs> so it, you know, when you look when you look at the aspect of how that goes into optimizations, right? You're starting to look at where your transitions have to happen and how you have to optimize, right? The idea is, as I remember the days when I used to deploy zip files, right? I'd go unzip yeah, and I'd move right. directory and. This is how I used to deploy and how cumbersome that was. And, you know, then we got into TFS and we started doing automated deploys. And then we got into DevOps and some more automated deploys and CI, CD. And you have to look at that, at that as that optimization and how we drove down costs from a deployment perspective, right? I mean, you and I mm -hmm. worked in a time where it would take us, what, four hours overnight to do a deploy? Over a weekend. Because we had to copy yeah. files and we had to test and we had to, you know pull this server down and reboot it and do all of this weird stuff to move all these DLLs around. And then we had DLL yep. hell where, you know, things wouldn't work out the way we wanted to. And we had to kind of keep mucking with DLLs until we got the, I mean, I remember those pains. The actual <laughs> like DLL yesterday. hell. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, here we are. Many thanks to our podcast sponsor, Clear Measure. Clear Measure is a software architecture company that empowers clients' development teams to be self-sufficient, moving fast, delivering quality, and running their systems with confidence. Whether starting a new project or developing new technologies or techniques, Clear Measure sets up your team to deliver world-class results. Learn more at www.clearmeasure.com. Clear Measure, empowering software delivery. Clear Measure is also happy to be a sponsor of the video podcast, Programming with Palermo. Watch, learn, and program alongside Chief Architect Jeffrey Palermo. Videos are added weekly and available on syndicated locations supporting video podcast or by visiting palermo.network. Tune in today. So large organizations have these strategic and broad plans and conversations with, you know, I'm spending this many millions on technology, blah, blah, blah. And if we can cut that this much percent, then it's still a significant number. But if we pull it all the way back to the smaller and mid-sized companies that, and, and tons of these you know, mid-sized companies are, are developing software applications these days, not just the yep. big ones. So if we kind of pull it back to get more, more tactical um, and you got these mid-sized companies that maybe, you know, 10 developers, but you can still, you can do a ton with 10 developers, but you know, yeah. not, not these big companies that have you know, a few thousand developers, but just pull, right. pull it way back. And they've got, you know, a set of applications and whatnot in there and they're developing for the cloud. They've moved some stuff. What should they, you know, tactically be thinking about in order to just get the best value for their Azure usage? Well, the, the way I always look at it and I tell folks is one, Architect small, mm -hmm. always come in and look for the smallest resource that you can leverage that is the most cost effective to get the job done. Don't go, don't get squirrel. Don't go after shiny new thing. You know, don't drive down that path. Always create a bolt on scenario, right? You want to be able to make your stuff Legos so mm. that as you go through, you don't paint yourself into a corner. You make yourself where you can keep snapping things on it and you can keep growing in a direction. And, and that's the biggest key. You know, when you look at things from a cost optimization, I always start out at serverless and start there and then work yourself into a VM. You know, don't start out with the first thought processes. All I know is VMs. Yeah. You know, look at the things, you know, from that perspective, understand your lines of demarcation or responsibility, right? You have to understand where your responsibility stops and Microsoft's picks up or any cloud provider picks up, right? So you've got to understand where that is so you don't get caught in this point. You know, I was having a, an interesting conversation with, with one of the managers one time that, you know, we were talking about how cloud adoption things come out and where it goes. And I'm like, most technology fails because people go after the shiny new object and then they blame the shiny new object because they knew nothing about it. 
Yeah. So learn about the things that you're going to do. Don't blame technology for your shortcoming. Everybody understands that we have, as developers, we're, we're done in a specific way and we have to hit deadlines. So don't pull things in that aren't in your forte, mm-hmm. right? Don't say, you know, I'm going to move data around, so I'm going to use Synapse, but I've never done it before, but I got two weeks to implement it. Right. Because you're not going to be successful at that point, right? Yeah. You've got to look and be able to pick and adjust your architecture and your applications as they see fit, right? You've got to make them to where they can grow. You've got to make them to where they can self-heal. You've got to make them where they can scale so that you can drive down costs. There's just a bunch of things that you have to pull in those arenas. That's an interesting mindset because you didn't mention it, but I'm, I'm thinking of available workforce, available people out there that have some experience with technology A or B or C. And right. there's so many choices out there. You can't argue that only one technology stack would ever work for a particular application type. Most applications, you could totally pick different stacks and yeah, it could work with that. I mean, just the regular stuff, a web application with some server-side processing and put all the data in SQL Server. I mean, how many freaking applications can you have with that boring old time-tested technology stack? <laughs> and that has a massive workforce that has experience with it. Whereas then yep. if you go, now it, it's being talked about it at conferences and it's sexy and you know, oh, MongoDB, Cosmos DB, oh, here's other things and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and you reach for it, but I'm thinking, okay, what should a manager look for? I'm wondering if, 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 if you know, part of the question could be what percentage of the available workforce has ever used that technology? And if we're, you know, 80% or more, it's like, okay, great. The risk is low there. If it's no, it's brand new. So only 3% of the workforce has actually ever put that in production. Ooh, maybe we should have think twice about it. Well, I, I look at things kind of somewhat of, of, of a bit different. You know, I look at it under the pretense of you always want to challenge your employees to be better, right? Mm-hmm. You always want to empower them to make a difference around innovation, but that comes with the dual-edged sword, right? Because you also want to ensure that they don't get caught up in the trap that we just discussed, right? Which is blaming the technology for your shortcomings. Mm -hmm. So I believe in the 80-20 rule. I look down and go, you know what? We're going to keep 80% 80 of our projects are going to stay the norm that we know that fits within our gap. But at 20% of the 20% of the projects that are a little bit out of scale, like meaning We've got longer time to do them. Maybe we pick a newer technology to introduce so that we can get everybody up to speed on that, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have to look for some value for innovation because it gets to be very dangerous if you get into the same into the mindset that you're never going to grow, right? Because you use always the tried and true, and then you never find out what is next. And then before you know it, the what is next is now taken over where you sit at and you have no transition policy um, for that. So you've got to be careful in my eyes for that. So I, I always try to find a happy balance of, you know, let's let's use what we're good at, but let's also challenge ourselves to what is that next said thing and, and what is the next thing that we want to learn or move to hmm. um, so that we can keep that innovation going, well, if that makes sense. Yeah. Are there Azure services that you found people being surprised at how costly they are when deployed? Like, oh, I didn't think it would cost this much. <laughs> well, you mentioned one of them, right? So I was working at a client one time and they said, you know, they wanted to go with a document DB, which is document DB or Cosmos at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, they decided to go with it. And I said, well, you don't really have a sweet spot for that. So make sure of these five things. Well, they didn't pay attention to the three, five things. And then they <laughs> were surprised when their bill was $57,000 a month, Oof. which was about $50,000 wow. over what they budgeted. Yeah. And you look down and you go, yeah, when you turn up the little knob for scale on document DB, yes, your RUs will run out of control and they'll keep running no matter what it is. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, you've got to be careful. So that was a, a lesson in one. You didn't look at what guardrails were as you introduce something, right? Because I talked about that 20%, but the 20% for me comes with guardrails. When we go in and do stuff, we look at what the limitations are and things like that. So we go into things more eyes open. You never want to go into something eyes closed Mm -hmm. because when you go into something eyes closed, you you end up dealing with the ramifications of what you just did. And in their case, the the bill was a hundred thousand dollars before we got it back under control. Wow. Um, Because it was, you know, two months before we got it in, then I had to teach them how to limit their RUs and, 
you know, go in and look for for retry mechanisms and things like that so that their furries would work, you know, much better, got some of their chattiness out of their apps out because they were all SQL shops. So they made very chatty applications, which you and I both know you don't want to do that on something like a document DB. So, you know, it is what it is. Well, in that conversation with databases, because, yeah, those are those can be really expensive resources. Compute tends to be pretty affordable. But the data side, there's rarely a case when applications that used to be using a relational database need to go whole hog conversion into a document database, as opposed to hmm, maybe one piece of data might benefit from being stored as collections rather than, you know, relational tables. but jumping and converting the whole thing that that just seems to be one of those examples of of chasing after the shiny new yep and that's the dangerous side too you know when people change at uh you know shiny new you get in trouble i was at a client many moons ago where i used angular to solve a problem mm -hmm. right and i got clubbed when i brought it up even though i had used it in one of the meetings because they said they had a project there and it was the word, it, it became a uh, Voldemort for the company because mm. they couldn't, it was the uh, software that you could not name because they had a big project and it failed because they use Angular. And I'm like, did well, did it fail because you used Angular or did it fail because the people that used Angular didn't know how to leverage it? Yeah. You know, there's a, there's, there's a difference in yeah. that. So you've got to be very careful about people jumping on a shiny thing like responsive design when they don't understand what responsive design or, or a framework like that actually means. So because then in an organization, you can give it a bad name by blaming it all the time. But going back to what we just talked about, which is you can't blame the technology for the shortcomings or the, the gap because people tend to want to point at it simply because they, get, they painted themselves into a corner because they went after that shiny thing and come to find out the shiny thing wasn't as easy as they thought it was going to be. Yeah. I've seen people do that with a lot of a lot of different technology or patterns. Uh, I've, yep. heard, I've heard domain driven design and aggregates being blamed for uh, you know, performance problems or whatnot. And then when you yep. look at it, you're like, why'd you do it that way? That's not really yep. how you should. <laughs> but when you look at it, you go, that's not really domain driven design. <laughs> well, if you think about it, like the Angular example or pick technology, whatnot, there's tons of people all over the world who have pretty good software running well, and yeah. they use that technology. So how, it, it, I mean, anyone in leadership in those situations ought to be able just to, to follow that logical trail and challenge anyone making that assertion. It's like, wait a minute, something's different in our usage of technology, A, eh? because there's a lot of people that are using it and it seems to work fine. Right. Well, I think we have a disparity a bit because you said management and I think management comes up with its own skill set, right? When you and I both know, when you head to management, you pick up a different skill set and maybe it's not the technology side. So you have to rely on the people that you bring in underneath you. So the problem behind that is, is if you go back to the, what we said before on the developers that chase things, you know, you may run into, you know, that scenario. And then the managers aren't overly technical enough as they used to be, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Back to back to some tactical, you know, nuggets that that people can can take away. Um, you know that pricing, the pricing calculator that Azure has. Uh, how yeah. do we really? If if we're let's say we're brand new cloud native application and we're putting it together, how do we actually estimate how much we think that it's going to cost to run? Well, here here's the problem with the the pricing calculator. The pricing calculator is not bad. It's the fact that when you run your own stuff internally, you really don't know what you're running, right? Mm -hmm. So let me give you a for instance. You go into a server, you're moving a web app out. You're transitioning the uh, server to a web app, right? Where is that conversion policy at, right? What is it that you actually need to move out there? How big does it actually need to be? You know, there's a there's a bigger question to me in this in the logic that goes in and says, hey, you know, what in the world are you going to do? What are you transitioning to? Do you understand what you're transitioning to? Meaning, if you're on a server and you're comparing it to your on-premises and you're moving it to an app service, how do you compare the two, right? Mm. Because an app service, you and I both know, an app service is the IIS layer, right? So how much resource do we actually need? So what they end up doing is they'll take the server and they'll go, oh, well, this is a an eight-core Xeon processor with 
you know, 32 gig of memory. Mm -hmm. So I need to get the equivalent in an app service to run on it. And that's not always the same. So to me, it's, it's, it's a point that you, you have to really look at one, your application. So I always run tests. What I normally do is I take the, I take the application before I move it out and I put it in the smallest instance I can. And then I see where it tips over Mm -hmm. and I start looking at why does it tip over? And I'll give you, for instance, I had a client that had a, that was moving from a big, huge cloud service that was like $8,000 a month to app services. We cut the cost significantly. However, we had to put very large app services in play because the development resources that created the app used a lot of in-session databases. And you know what I mean by that. Mm. So they did a lot of very bad programming mechanisms for memory leaks and things like that. So we ended up having to clean a lot of that up in the application, but it is what it is at the end of the day, right? You can't, you're, you're going to be a slave to however that app was developed. And then you're going to be a slave to whatever it was running on before. So you have to kind of find that happy mechanism. So I tell everybody, try your stuff out there, see what happens, tweak it up. Don't try to tweak it down, right? Mm -hmm. Go out there and put as small as you can, see how your performance is see how you can instance it to make sure it can instance across multiple instances, which in a a particular application I was talking about, they could not instance. So we had to keep it single instance. So you had all of these things that you have to kind of solve. So it's not, I don't think to me, it's an easy way to say how to use that. The pricing calculator should be used as a estimation. You should sit down with that pricing calculator and give your best swag at where you want to start. And then look at how you can expand from there. That way you can kind of get a holistic picture around, you know, what's my database cost? What are my rough estimates around app services? You know, what kind of data structure do I need to pick? Can I move it to more of a server, a serverless or managed instance or PaaS? What do I really want to sit my, my database service at? Mm-hmm. Sometimes you can do it, sometimes you can't. And the only time you know is when you try it in that point, right? Yeah. So, you know, to me, there, it, it's not an exact science. And I think that's what people look for. It is exact pointer to go, I want to save money. How do I do that? Give me some blog posts somewhere that tells me, well, I can do like everybody else. I can give you a blog post that says, buy reserve instances, do this, do that. But at the end of the day, it doesn't take into account what you developed or what uh, shortcomings your application had that mm-hmm. may stop you from being able to do that. You yeah. know, somebody takes your recommendation and says, hey, let me move this to pass. They can't run it in PaaS because say they have the same problem we did, but to an nth degree where they can't use a PaaS based service to run it. And they really do have to use a VM because of some third party yeah, dependency. Yeah. Now they go, well, you just gave me something that was not successful. Well, I didn't know how your app was running. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really, there's an idiosyncrasy that goes into this that I, I don't think a lot of people grasp that it's not an exact science to go down and go, yes, I can produce this doc that'll hit, I don't know, 40 to 50% of your applications, but that's only going to cover half your organization. I can send out yeah. emails going, cut your, get, get reserve instances or do this or move this from, you know, a, a VM to a web app. And I can give you all of these things. But at the end of the day, I don't know how much it's going to save anybody, yeah. depending on how that app reacts when you put it out there. So there may be tech debt you have to take into account that you have to go in and fix. And is it worth fixing, right? You and I have sat in points where we've had to have those tough talks with clients where it's like, hey, we can fix this, but it's not, you're not going to make enough money to get your ROI out of it. Does mm-hmm. it, what does this make sense for us to do if you're never going to reap the return on, on what we have to do to the application? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, um, sometimes I think it makes sense also to do a swag calculation when, once you have something running and say, okay, it's costing us this much in production. And I mean, if it's, if it's costing you, you know, small amounts of money, it's definitely not worth it. But if it, if it's costing you more than you want, then you think, hmm, if we had one of our developers spend some number of weeks in an attempt to optimize this, okay, how much does that labor capacity cost you for a couple of weeks? And then if we could, you know, cut it in half, you know what? That could be a worthy trade-off because yep. unless, until an application's optimized, I find that the first pass, you always get some really good low hanging fruit, even if it's just like caching for a 10th of a second from one process to another over a network or database. You know, if if it's never been optimized in any way, you always have low hanging fruit. 
Yep, yep. But I find I find SQL PaaS instances turning on the um, what is it? The automatic optimization where it starts putting in indexes and things mm. like that and trying things without any interaction is so beneficial because you find that that drives down your instance count um, by most when it starts getting in and uh, all those indexes in, and then you see your usage coming down and coming down and coming down. Mm. Yeah, yeah. What's your thought on all these PaaS services versus seemingly it looks like more and more compute is going into containers? And of course, the Azure container apps on the one side and then the Kubernetes hosted on the other side. Does it change the theory at all or is it, oh, it's just the same thing, just a different way to run stuff? Well, it, it does, but it doesn't, right? So at the end of the day, containers come with a, a twofold problem. One, they need infrastructure to run on um, and they can't run on their own. However, that's the same as an app service because mm -hmm. when you look at Azure very specifically, it is app service, app fabric at the end of the day yeah. and it's containerizing whatever you're putting out anyway. So it builds in good app boundaries. My problem is the containers are become a zoo, right? So now they're things you have to take care of. So when you start looking at how you have to take care of things when you put them out, now you have hardening containers, you have new container instances that need to go out, you have to test your applications against the new container instances. So you're creating this whole bid around it. But I kind of understand because then it becomes really much more cloud agnostic, right? Because now you can run a container of code on any cloud depending on whichever service you decide to pick on any one of the clouds. So, uh, you know, to me, it's a good approach. However, it does create another level of things that we have to take care of. So going back to our on-premises talk, this is where a lot of folks come into that bit. And I think, you know, everybody wants to try to, to isolate their stuff and they want to create them in such a way that they go through this process. But, you know, it is what it is. Privatized workloads is another thing you know, on Azure, when you start looking at PEs and, and isolating workloads to where they're not publicly accessible anymore, you know, you've got your own separate top on talk on that as well. Um, so, you know, it is what it is at the end of the day. So it sounds like the assertion that some have made that, uh, oh, developers can just throw stuff into the cloud and developers don't need any support from people with the classical sysadmin skill set. Sounds like that's not really the case. Either some of the developers are going to have to cross train and be good enough at that stuff, at this stuff, or you really need somebody who actually has the competence to, to make sure we're not making rookie mistakes. Right. Well, and, and developers can kind of do that. I mean, when you look at things like ARM templating and, and, you know, Terraform and things like that, that can generate resources really, really great. But who are you going to have to tweak those resources? Because Sometimes things don't always work out the way you expect them to, right? Mm -hmm. Who's going to tweak them? Who's going to check them? Who's going to look at them when they're misbehaving? Who's going to monitor them? Who's going to do it? So there's much more that goes into this process as a whole. I think that a lot of companies just don't answer. They look and, you know, like, like most places, they just want to be able to cut, you know, as much cost as they can. Sometimes they, they overcut the cost that they need. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, you know, that's where the bad side comes in, right? So, you know, I've looked at Azure, you know, I think you and I discussed, I think on the first podcast where, you know, I sat down with a group of folks and they said, you know, why are you trying to eliminate our jobs? And I looked up and I go, so you like, you know, uh, doing uh, patching on Friday nights, you like getting yeah. calls in the middle of the club hour when you're out on Saturday nights and have to get on all these calls, you like that. And they were like, well, no. So I'm like, if I could pull that out of your range, is that, is that good? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, good. Welcome to the cloud. Mm -hmm. The cloud is there to enhance folks, which means if you've overhired folks to cover your infrastructure internally, you may have a right sizing practice that has to happen, right? Because you have more people that were used to run internal stuff that now either need to be trained and or reduced depending on, um, you know, the, the workloads that are now in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at where that enhanceability comes in, you know? You and I being military folks, we saw this 10 times over with, you know, deployments and things like that. Sometimes you needed a small force. Sometimes you need a large force. It just really depends. Sometimes you shrunk that large force down depending on, you know, what was happening in the arena. So it is what it is. At the end of the yeah. day, you have to be more dynamic as a company and as a group to what's going in. And that's why I feel it's beneficial with some of the cross-training, cross-pollination, but you still need people that are subject matter experts 
and the things that you need. Otherwise, you're going to have to offload that as well. Yeah. Meaning you're going to have to rely on somebody else to come in, figure out what you're doing, which means you pay a, a premium for that um, because they're going to have to figure out where you're at before they can figure out how to get you to the next step. Yeah. And everybody has to cross train a little bit. I mean, classical, yep. classical sysadmins. Yeah. Guess what? Got to do some more coding of some sort. Yep. Classical yep. programmers. Yeah. We got to be more you know, resource network server compute aware of what yep. the programmers are coding. So it's, it's cross training yep. for everybody. Yes, sir. Well, man, this is a lot of information. I feel like we could, we could, we can go on for quite a while, but, uh, uh, this is this is a, a a great great show. I appreciate you coming back on the podcast and and sharing with us your view on optimizing cloud budgets and what to think about and mistakes to avoid. So, yes, sir. Yeah, it's great to have you back on the show. Yes, sir. And until next time, keep shipping. You've been listening to the Azure DevOps Podcast, a show for developers and DevOps professionals shipping software using Microsoft technologies. Go to www.azuredevops.show for show notes and other episodes. On behalf of your host, Jeffrey Palermo, and our sponsors, thanks for listening, and may God bless you.